you mentioned humanoid robots. So what do you think about Optimus, uh, about Teslabot? Do you think we'll have robots in the factory and, and in the home in 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years? Yeah. I think it's a very hard project. I think it's going to take a while. But who else is going to build humanoid robots at scale? Yeah. And I think it is a very good form factor to go after because, like I mentioned, the, hu- uh, the world is designed for humanoid form factor. These things would be able to operate our machines. They would be able to sit down in chairs, uh, dr- potentially even drive cars. Uh, basically, the world is designed for humans. That's the form factor you want to invest into and make work over time. Uh, I think you know there's another school of thought, which is, okay, pick a problem and design a robot to it. But actually designing a robot and getting a whole data engine and everything behind it to work is actually an incredibly hard problem. So it makes sense to go after general interfaces that, uh, okay, they, they are not perfect for any one given task, but they actually have the generality of just with a prompt with English able to do something across. And so I think it makes a lot of sense to go after a general uh, interface um, in the physical world. And I think it's a very difficult project. I think it's going to take time. Um, but I see no other no other company that can execute on that vision. I think it's going to be amazing. It, like uh, basically physical labor. Like if you think transportation is a large market, try physical labor. <laughs> it's like insane. Well, but it's not just physical labor. To me, the thing that's also exciting is the uh, social robotics. So mm-hmm. the the relationship we'll have on different levels with those robots. Yeah, that's why I was really excited to see Optimus. Like um, people have criticized me for the excitement, but I've I've worked with uh, a lot of research labs that do humanoid legged robots, um, Boston Dynamics, Unitree. A lot. There's a lot of companies that do legged robots, but that's the the elegance of the movement is a tiny tiny part of the big picture so integrating the two big exciting things to me about tesla doing humanoid or any legged robots is clearly integrating it into the data engine mm-hmm. so yeah. the the data engine aspect so yeah. the actual intelligence for yeah. the perception and the and the control and, and the planning and all that kind yeah. of stuff integrating into this huge the fleet right. that you mentioned right um and then speaking of fleet the second thing is the mass manufacturer just knowing yeah. uh culturally uh driving towards a simple robot that's cheap to produce at scale yeah. and doing that well, having experience to do that well, that changes everything. That's why that's a very different culture and style than Boston Dynamics, who, by the way, those those robots are just, the, the way they move, it's uh, like, it'll be a very long time before Tesla can achieve the smoothness of movement, but that's not what it's about. It's, it's, about, uh, it's about the entirety of the system, like we talked about the data engine and the right. fleet. And that's super exciting. Even the initial sort of models, uh, but that too was really surprising that in a few months you can get a, pr- a prototype. Yep. And the reason that happened very quickly is, as you alluded to, there's a ton of uh, copy paste from what's happening on the autopilot. Yes. A lot. The amount of expertise that like came out of the woodworks at Tesla for building the human robot was incredible to see. Like, basically, Elon said at one point, we're doing this. And then next day, basically, like all these CAD models started to appear and people talking about like the supply chain and manufacturing yeah. and uh, people showed up with like screwdrivers and everything like the other day <laughs> and started to like put together the body. And I was like, whoa, like all these people exist at Tesla and fundamentally building a car is actually not that different from building a robot. The same, and that is true, uh, not just for uh, the hardware pieces and also let's not forget hardware, not just for a demo, but um, manufacturing <laughs> of that hardware at scale it is like a whole different thing. But for software as well, basically this robot currently thinks it's a car. <laughs> uh, it's so, going to have a, a midlife crisis at some point. <laughs> <laughs> it thinks it's a car. Um, some of the earlier demos, actually, we were talking about potentially doing them outside in the parking lot because that's where all of the computer <laughs> vision <laughs> was like working out of the box <laughs> <That's funny. laughs> instead of like in, inside. Um, but all the operating system, everything just copy pastes. Uh, computer vision, mostly copy pastes. I mean, you have to retrain the neural nets, but the approach and everything and data engine and offline trackers and the way we go about the occupancy tracker and so on, everything copy pastes. You just need to retrain the neural nets. Uh, and then the planning control, of course, has to change quite a bit. But there's a ton of copy paste from what's happening at Tesla. And so if you were to, if you were to go with goal of like, okay, let's build a million human robots and you're not Tesla, that's, a, that's a lot to ask. If you're Tesla, it's actually like, it's not. It's not that crazy. And then the, then the follow-up question is: Then how difficult, just like we're driving, how difficult is the manipulation task, yeah. uh, such that it can have an impact at scale? I think, depending on the context, the really nice thing about 
robotics is the um, unless you're doing manufacturing and that kind of stuff, is there's more room for error. Yep. Driving is so safety critical and so that it, and also time critical. Like a robot is allowed to move slower. Yep. Which is nice. Yes. <laughs> I think it's going to take a long time, but the way you want to structure the development is you need, you need to say, okay, it's going to take a long time. How can I set up the uh, product development road, roadmap so that I'm making revenue along the way? I'm not setting myself up for a zero one loss function where it doesn't work until it works. You don't want to be in that position. You want to make it useful almost immediately, and then you want to slowly deploy it uh, uh, and uh, at scale, generalize hopefully. it at scale. And you want to set up your data engine, your improvement loops, the telemetry, the evaluation, the harness, and everything. Um, and uh, you want to improve the product over time incrementally, and you're making revenue along the way. That's extremely important because otherwise you cannot build these these uh, large undertakings just like don't make sense economically. And also from the point of view of the team working on it, they need the dopamine along the way. They're not just going to make a promise about this being useful. This is going to change the world in 10 years when it works. This is not where you want to be. You want to be in a place like I think Autopilot is today where it's offering increased uh, safety and, um, and uh, convenience of driving today. People pay for it, people like it, people purchase it. And then you also have the greater mission that you're working towards. Mm -hmm. And you see that. So the dopamine for the team, that, that was a source of happiness. And, yes, and 100%. Satisfaction. You're deploying this, people like it, people drive it, people pay for it, they care about it. There's all these YouTube videos. Your grandma drives it, <laughs> she gives you feedback. People like it, people engage with it. You engage with it, huge. Do uh, people that drive Teslas like recognize you and give you love? Like, uh, like, hey, thanks for the, <laughs> for the, <laughs> for yeah. this nice feature that is doing. Yeah, I think the tricky thing is like some people really love you. Some people, unfortunately, like you're working on something that you think is extremely valuable, useful, etc. Some people do hate you. There's a lot of people who like hate me and the team and what everything, the whole project. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I think Are they uh, Tesla drivers. <laughs> uh, in many cases, they're not yeah. actually. Yeah, that's that's actually makes me sad about humans or the current the ways that humans interact. I think that's actually fixable. I think humans want to be good to each other. I think Twitter and social media is part of the mechanism that actually somehow makes the negativity more viral, mm -hmm. that it doesn't deserve, like disproportionately uh, add a, like a vir viral boost yeah. to the negativity. But like, I, I, I wish people would just get excited about, uh, so suppress some of the jealousy, mm -hmm. some of the ego, and just get excited for others. And then, there's a karma aspect to that. You get excited for others, they'll get excited for you. Same thing in academia. If you're not careful, there is a like a dynamical system there. If you if you think of in silos and get jealous of somebody else being successful, that actually perhaps counterintuitively uh, leads to less productivity of you as a community and you individually. I feel like if you keep celebrating others, that actually makes you more successful. Yeah. And I think people haven't in depending on the industry haven't quite learned that yet. Yeah. Some people are also very negative and very vocal, so they're very prominently featured, but actually there's a ton of people who are uh, cheerleaders, but they're silent cheerle cheerleaders. And yeah. uh, when you talk to people just in the world, they will all tell you oh, it's amazing, it's great. Especially like people who understand how difficult it is to get this stuff working. Like people who have built products and makers and entrepreneur entrepreneurs, like make, making this work and changing something is is incredibly hard. Those people are more likely to cheerlead you. <laughs> well, one of the things that makes me sad is some folks in the robotics community uh, don't do the cheerleading and they should. Hmm. There's a, cause they know how difficult it is. Well, they actually sometimes don't know how difficult it is to create a product at scale, right? Yeah. To actually deploy in the real world. Yeah. A, a lot of the development of robots and AI system is done on very specific small benchmarks. Um, and as yeah. opposed to real world conditions. Yes. Uh, yeah, I think it's really hard to work on robotics in an academic setting. 